Forgive my getting organized. Um, the floor has been moving a little faster than we expected. Um, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem, I'm going to try a couple things and try not to bore everyone out of their minds over the next hour. Um, some of what I'm going to touch on is going to be a little technical, part of it really cranky. Um, I have a number of different boards, and they're going to try to hit different points in different orders. Um, and I'll beg of staff, help me sort of get them all sort of stacked up right here if we could. First thing, I want to go to Geek Town for a moment, just to put something in perspective of a thing I've come to this floor since January talking about inflation. Now, how many of you remember the discussions we were all having, actually it was being more had at us, that inflation was transitory? And now we sort of apologize, the Federal Reserve, the Treasury Secretary Yellen, um, hopefully the White House, so the White House seems to be disconnected from reality, that it's not transitory. If you saw the numbers that came out last Thursday, Friday, we have something called structural. What does that mean to anyone? Um, does this place even care to understand? So first, let's do the first bit of geeky. When you hear a discussion that the yield curve is inverted, how many of you immediately reach over to your television and go, oh God, I have the wrong channel on, and turn it off? It's not that complicated. It's a way of people using big words to try to sound smart. Inverted yield curve just means, hey, I expect over the next two years to have higher inflation so the value of my dollar goes down faster than I do over the 10 years. That means if I buy a 10-year bond, I might be willing to take an interest rate here, but I expect inflation to be so high in the next two years, I want a higher interest rate. Because theoretically, it's real simple, when things take longer, you should have more risk and therefore want a higher interest rate. Why is this important to a conversation on the floor of the house? Go look on your favorite financial website right now. The two years has a higher interest rate than the 10-year. The five years has a higher interest rate than a 10-year. The seven-year has a higher interest rate than the 10-year. That is the markets telling you that they expect inflation to be with us for years. You also saw in the inflation report we received last week, you saw my brothers and sisters on the left, hey, energy prices are down, yay, oh, oh why is the core inflation so high? Congratulations, you did it. Functionally, 30 years of substantial stability in inflation, and we got ourselves a wage price spiral. We dumped so much money In functionally March 2001, so much money into the economy that it set off what's called a pri wage price spiral. Wages go up, you got to raise your prices. Well, if you raise your prices, you got to pay your workers more. Well, if you pay your workers more, you got to raise your prices. What happens when that becomes embedded into the structure of the economy and energy goes up and down? And you know, how many of our friends on the left keep saying, well, it's Ukraine? Of course, if you remove you know, energy prices, you still have inflation built into the core. This is really, really horrible, dangerous, brutal. Does anyone here give a damn about poor people? Does anyone here care about the working middle class? Does anyone care about people trying to retire? you got to understand the brutality. Because where's that money go? So I'm going to show some boards here. I represent the Phoenix Scottsdale area. I have the highest inflation in the continental United States. Still trying to figure out why Alaska has an urban zone that's higher than mine, but functionally I have the highest inflation in the country. If you live and work in my community and did not have a pay hike, I'm going to show it and you're going to hear this multiple times. You now work for a month and a half for free. This place functionally taxed you. A month and a half of your labor has been stripped from you. 
and the money doesn't disappear. What happens is your wages become worth less purchasing, but that wealth transfer from you is actually a form of tax because the $30 trillion over here of borrowed money your government has actually now gets to be paid back with dollars of less value. Whether you know it or not, if you're my neighbor in the Phoenix Scottsdale area, you've been taxed out of a month and a half of your wages. And thank you. You helped to actually buy down the U.S. debt because borrowers benefit from inflation. But people trying to save, people getting ready to buy a home, getting ready for retirement, people just trying to survive get crushed. So if you listen to the floor the last couple of days, how many times have you had someone come to this floor and actually show they even care? No, but we'll give some great speeches about, hey, 50 you know, illegal crossers of our border got shipped to Martha's Vineyard. Oh, come to my state. That's like every few minutes. I'm a border state. Come down to Yuma with me. Let me show you what the hell's actually going on. But Washington, D.C., my brothers and sisters in the left, I'm still waiting for them to come behind these microphones and apologize for functionally what is the biggest tax in U.S. history. You know, we're now rivaling what happened to this country in the late 70s, very early 80s. Except the crisis is much more complex now. And here's why. Yes, you had the Wage, wage spirals, the price spirals, the fuel spirals of the late 70s. But you had a beneficial demographics. You had lots of available workers. Today we have this crazy thing going on where our available work population because of our demographics. My fear is the Federal Reserve is going to have to break the back of employment in this country to squeeze out inflation. Are we all ready for that? Because this legislature, this Congress, as Republicans, we've come behind these mics multiple times. I've introduced legislation saying, look, what is inflation? Inflation is too many dollars chasing too few goods. You can do one of two things. You can squeeze the dollars out of society. So all that free money that the Democrats gave away over the last couple of years, raise interest rates, pull liquidity out, take it away. Or we can make more stuff. I'm going to show a couple boards here of what's happened to productivity the last couple quarters. We're crashing. Our productivity is crashing. When you do the fancy math and you are not making more stuff, it means what the Federal Reserve is going to have to do to us is more and more brutal. And I think actually some of the markets are actually starting to wake up the last couple of days and start to understand the malfeasance, the economic malfeasance of this place. But then again, I sometimes wonder if I work with a bunch of people that don't own a calculator or didn't show up to their high school economics class, because this isn't that complicated. We use big fancy words. We do brilliant virtue signaling, but the math is brutal. And I think we need to wake up when you saw what the president did, what was it on 60 Minutes a couple days ago, complete disconnect from what's happening to the middle class and the poor going on in this country. So let's actually use a few boards here just to try to provide some textual facts to how this all works. Now just trying to make a point and this is, you know, for myself. I represent the Phoenix Scottsdale area. And now we have the highest inflation in the nation. So maybe if you're in a community that, you know, you're, you're hey, you only had 7%. I, my folks are breaking 13. Try being the working family that's trying to survive in a world where your purchasing power lost 13%. Your rents are still going up. Rents are eventually going to come down when the Federal Reserve has started to break the back of employment. That may be as much as 18 months away. 
we're finally starting to see our home prices start to tip a bit because, what is it, um, a first deed of trust, first mortgage these days is now well over 6% if it's a conforming loan. But it is fascinating. It's also the communities that have had some of the greatest economic prosperity because there's people moving there that also seem to be suffering the highest inflation. But when you start to actually look at some of the drivers, and this is, you know, um, July 21 to July 22. Okay, energy, hey, it's 2.7% of that inflation. But start to add in shelter, start to add in energy, start to add in and come back up here, and all the other things. And this is the stuff right here, this, this, and food. So just skip the energy portion. And that's why we're making the argument, and you saw it in the, um, CPI dated this last week. It's now structural. It's now structural. And at some point, if I lose my mind, I'm going to talk about what happens now that the U.S. dollar is going up. And remember, why does the U.S. dollar now starting to go up? I know we're geeking out. And our interest rates are going up. If you're in a country over here saying, hey, I can put money into a U.S. dollar denominated bond and get this high interest rate, I'm going to pull my money out of this country and put it over here. Okay, so now there's a hunger to convert to dollars, raising the value of the dollar, okay? But do understand, we're now exploring our inflation around the world. So the crappy economics this place did, now you're kicking the rest of the world's head in. So we often talk about how much we care about the poor, how much we care about the poor around the world. Does anyone understand here when we blow up our own economics? We export our bad policy. It's very much like when we did the tax reform, the very end of 2017, because we did so many things right and boosted economic growth so substantially and GDP growth and you know, lowered income inequality and all those good things were happening here in the United States, the World Bank actually raised worldwide GDP projections because when we got our economics right, the rest of the world actually got less poor. Well, now you're seeing the other side of the coin. When we get our economics wrong, we also export misery. And, and some of these charts you've all seen before. I've had them here on the floor. And it's just basically trying to show, look at the, just look at this line here. This is functionally what's happening to your ability to afford things. And you'll notice it happened functionally almost the day this place had unified leftist control. When the Democrats took control of the White House, had already control of the Senate and the House of Representatives, and they pushed through their policies, you can almost see, hey, policies change. And yes, look at the time of the pandemic, but at least when it came to your purchasing power, your ability to survive, it was fairly stable. And this line coming down here, you that collapse, that's thanks to you for Democrat policies. And we've been trying it. If anyone has a suggestion on a better way we could do this, I'm trying to visually come up with some way because we're often engaged in sort of a, a malpractice here. We use big fancy words. We talk about, well, I have 13% inflation in my Phoenix market. And I've been trying to find a way to describe what that actually means to a working family. So that's where we came up with this concept of saying, do you realize how many days of your labor you've lost? And then we've tried to doing where you'd also adjust it for, you know, what does gasoline prices cost? How many days of labor do you lose for higher gasoline prices? If anyone has a suggestion how graphically we can sort of show, here's the labor you lost just because of higher fuel prices. But here's the labor you lost just because of what's happened in my area, air conditioning prices. In your area, it might be heating. You're going to have a fun winter for those of you who don't live in the desert. Um, but also, our core inflation, we've been trying to do things like show a calendar. Is there another way you can help the American people understand the stress they're feeling 
for some reason, there's a lot less, what's the old saying, a lot less month left instead of cash at the end of the month? It's real. It's pervasive. And there also needs to be an understanding. The inflation that this place set off this last year will be part of our economics for a decade or two. So if you're the person thinking about retiring a decade from now, I sure hope you're re-looking at everything you need. How many dollars you have to set aside. What's your housing, what's your health care. Because you've got to also understand, there's some inputs here. So let's say if the mean inflation in the country is 8 9%. Health care in the country is functionally running double that. Are you ready to have your copay? on your future health care be double what it is today. Because that's what's coming at you. So yes, the Democrats have pushed a subsidy bill on drug prices, but that doesn't cover the fact that inflation's about to come kick your head in. And it's, once again, it's just also reaching into the general fund, putting it over here. We're going to borrow the money with them. We're going to find some way to tax it from you or tax it from my kids. And you know the world has changed. And let's see if I can actually find some of these to make it a little easier. But when you start to realize, when even the left-wing talking head Democrat apologists who hold economics degrees are basically standing up and talking about the misery the Democrat policies have brought to this country. So let's see, we had Jason Furman. How many of you have ever seen Jason Furman say a single nice thing about a Republican? Of course not. He basically makes his living berating those of us on the right and basically defending Democrat policies. When the math has gotten so ugly, he can no longer defend what Democrats have done to people in this country. The medium CPI, which is, excludes all the large changes in either direction and is a better predictor by labor markets slack. Now, this is important, trying to get here. He, Jason Furman is basically trying to help you understand that when you're busting through a 9.5% annual rate in August, the single highest monthly print in the data sets, which started in 1983. I don't mean this to be disjointed. I, I, I want it to sort of become crisp. When the core of inflation is functionally higher than any time it's been published since 1983. How old were you in 1983? Do you remember the level of misery? Congratulations. This is what the policies around this place did. And if you get a clown that's trying to say, oh, it's Ukraine, it's this and that. No, it's not. This stuff was in the futures market long before. Do you remember a year ago, September, when the futures markets and energies and those things were blowing off the charts? That was telling you this was coming. But that would require some economic literacy. And, and look, I, I accept some of this is geeking out. When you start to try to do CPI and core CPI, the simple point of a chart like this is it's not like, hey, we had this huge fluctuation of fuel prices, but everything else was fairly normal. Sorry, it's not. This is my Phoenix area. And when you start to realize that my folks are living with over 13%, it might be a reason why a lot of us from the West are incredibly cranky. Because we're getting now, just now, the announcements of how much our, our electricity is going to be going up. For the rest of you in the country, you know, we're about to hit our lovely time of the year. When the temperature comes down, we're not running our air conditioners. 
you're all getting ready to turn on your heat. Have you set aside, has, have all of you in the colder states, have you started to budget your money for what's about to hit you in your heating bills? You know, and for my brothers and sisters on the left, you better hope that it doesn't hit cold before the election day, before your folks start to see their power bills. Just sort of making the point, food prices continue to increase, with food at home having the largest annual increase since the end of the 70s. Now, I was in high school in the late 70s. I'm willing to admit it, and fashion was pretty horrible and inflation was worse. I remember watching my president get up on television wearing a sweater explaining that we were going to have to live poor. I remember this old guy running for president who was actually optimistic, saying, hey, if we open up our reserves and natural gas and those things, we'll live better. Um, that was also one of the great ironies. That one of the oldest, I think the oldest candidate running for president in history, that Ronald Reagan, had the biggest portion of young people voting for him. And it was because of optimism. I desperately want to get behind this microphone and demonstrate optimism. I have a seven-year-old and 11-week-old at my age. That's being pathologically optimistic. I want my little boy, my little girl to have an amazing American life. You know, the, the American dream is not some sort of piece of rhetoric to me. It is what we're structurally, a gift we're given. And the math is horrendous. My 11-week-old son that we just, that just came to us as a surprise. In 30 years, so he's entering sort of the beginning of his peak earning years, the United States will have, on today's dollars, on today's math, without inflation calculated in it, this is from CBO a couple of weeks ago, and they had not put inflation, long-term inflation into this math, $128 trillion of borrowed money in today's dollars. $128 trillion borrowed money in today's dollars. So of course, this place is fixated on how we're going to save that next generation. How we're going to create economic prosperity, economic growth, because growth is moral. Oh, sorry. I, I take that back. It's moral to some of us. Control, power, voting out $4 trillion of borrowing since this White House, since this unified Democrat government, with a stunning amount of that money being transferred in subsidies to people that vote for them. And they don't demonstrate even a hood of caring for survival of people who are going to be in retirement. For these young people, that's another Congress's problem. If this place had a soul, we would be fixated day on day of day of what we're going to do to make more stuff to bend inflation so the Federal Reserve doesn't have to break the back of people's lives. Of a future where instead of having the debate of, hey, Obamacare, let's subsidize things more, the Republican alternative, which was also a subsidy bill, screw that. Why don't we do something that's rational? Maybe we should change the price of health care, adopt technology, cure things. And look, I've done dozens of presentations here on the economics of cures, the economics of technology disruptions in health care. And yes, it means you have to say no to armies of lobbyists. It's also the only mathematical way I can find you save this place, save this country, save this experiment, save my little boy's economic future, my little girl's future. But we're not going to do it because it doesn't hand huge amounts of power and control to the left. It's not a check from government to someone that's going to turn around and write one political party a check. And it is that cynical. So what do we do? We're going to watch cable television for a couple days, complain about 50 migrants 
who illegally crossed into the country showing up in Martha's Vineyard. Because, well, that's easy to understand. It's good television. At the same day, you got how much poorer that day because of inflation. You got that much closer to Social Security having no money left in the trust fund. That $128 trillion I just mentioned to you, every dime from the $30 trillion borrowing we're at today to that $128 trillion, the model says every dime of that increased borrowing, 75% is Medicare, 25% is Social Security, the rest of the budget's in balance. Okay, the problem's right in front of us. Let's do something bold and fix Social Security, except the Social Security proposals around here are absurd. There are some things we can do where you don't do taxes in a mechanism where you actually slow the economy down and therefore lose much of the economic growth you were trying to fix to be able to have revenues in FICA. And then the revolution I've talked about so many times here on the floor of disruption of cure diseases. And I don't mean this to sound like a non sequitur, but it ties in. Diabetes is basically a third of all healthcare spending. Type 2, really complex, some genetic, a lot of it lifestyle, but we help fund it through how we do the farm bill and other things. We know there's been a breakthrough. It's only like a half a dozen people, and it's very short term, so we don't have the, long sh uh, the longer latitudinal data, who've been cured of type 1. Think about the hundreds of billions of dollars this place basically was handing out that we all know we're going to be here a year from two holding hearings on how much of it was stolen, wasted, handed out to political cronies and favoritism. Could you imagine if we took a fraction of those dollars and said, well, diabetes is 31% of all Medicare spending, it's 33% of all healthcare spending, maybe having the revolution of a cure there really hard. Oh, by the way, it's also the single biggest thing you could do for U.S. sovereign debt and the future economic growth of the country. Because it turns out, when we look at poverty, the number of our brothers and sisters who are really below the poverty line, we always, I have some members here, oh, it's racism. Oh, it's education. Turns out, health. Health may be the number one component. Grandma just had her foot cut off because of diabetes. What does that do to the entire family structure's ability to participate in the economy? Maybe the moral discussion, I represent a tribal community that has the second highest per capita diabetes in the world. Number one's right down the street, it's the sister tribe. If you actually cared, having a disruptive conversation of, screw it, we're going to find a way to have this health revolution because it's great economics. It's also moral. It's compassionate. It's loving. And saying we're going to build one more clinic. We're going to build more clinics. That's compassion. We're going to help teach you how to live with your misery when there's a path for a cure. It's just that optimism that should be part of the ethos of what we are. Maybe it doesn't raise us political money. M maybe it's not good campaigns. Maybe it's, maybe it's beyond our intellectual comprehension around here. I mean, God knows the intellectual gravitas of this place is just almost become trite when you hear the debates and the discussions we have on the floor. But the economics are sound, the compassion is noble, and it's actually the right thing to do. And yet, I can't tell you, I've been doing this, what, for a few years now. The poor, the poor staff here who's had to listen to these speeches and watch me hold up these boards and then try to scribe it down, which I apologize when I do the machine gun talking. There is a path here. but. I'm trying to find this, a couple of the slides that are just terrifying me right now. And, and, I, and I accept the, the media, 
excuse me, the, the, the Democrat pop propagandists, yeah, media, same thing, don't want to talk about inflation, what it does to people. Don't want to talk about what it does to retirees and young couples and those things, but because it's not going to help their friends win. But maybe understanding it, maybe actually having it be written about in a moral aspect, moral discussion of what we're doing to working families in this country might actually get some of us off our heinies to come here and do things saying, hey, you do realize there's policy we can engage in. And naming a piece of legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, when it does no such thing. When it comes back being scored as, hey, you know, several years from now, it's still borrowing money. And the way the Democrats were scoring, saying, well, we get inflation reduction by taxing people. And yanking money out of the economy by lowering productivity, taking their money away. Oh, by the way, all the um, savings and it's in the future years and it's all gimmicks. And that's not me talking. That's actually liberal groups that were scoring the bill that were outraged on the fake economics. And you start looking at this growing divergence, the split of inflation in metro areas and other parts of the country. I mean, San Francisco, where you now have people abandoning it, has only about 5.7% 5 .5 inflation. Where they're coming to, places like my community, I'm busting through 13. Can you see why I'm concerned? I'm looking for a chart, and my fear is I don't have it here, maybe in the piles over there. There was data out about 10 days ago talking about productivity. Now, who knows what productivity is? Okay, the way they do the model, you know, the, the people that score this, they basically say, hey, we have this many workers, and those workers produce this many units of, of production. Okay, and we've been doing this modeling for a very long time. And it's really good for the economy when a worker actually produces more every day than they did the day before. And that's not just because, hey, they made the production line go faster, it's because we got the tax code right, so they did investments. Ah, you did find it, thanks. So one of the amazing things that happened after the 2017 tax reform is we did something called expensing in it. Now, part of that expensing, you actually got to take, I'm going to geek out, the last quarter of 2017, so that's why there's this sudden lift in the end of 2017, even before the tax reform was done, because we did something retrospectively. And then the next couple years, boom, you saw all this capital coming back in from the rest of the world because we fixed um, the international repatriation incentives to bring money back to the country. And then we said, if you will go buy a piece of equipment that will make you faster, better, cleaner, more productive, we're going to let you, instead of expense, uh, depreciating it over the next decade, we're going to let you take it on day one. And yes, we take a big hit today on tax receipts, but eventually we, that was going to happen on the tax receipts. It just happens over a longer time. But we take it today, but here's the catch. We get a sudden pop of productivity, so there's more economic activity, and those new step up in, in activity mean we get more tax revenues in the next couple years. And guess what happened? Speech after speech after speech of our brothers and sisters on the left, this is a giveaway to the rich. It's a giveaway to big corporations. Tax revenues, are, we're heading, I have quotes from a half a dozen members, senior Democrat members here, who told us we were going to go into depression. Because what the Republicans did in tax reform, and guess what happened? Within a year, the poor started getting less poor. The middle class got much more prosperous. Income inequality started to shrink. Food insecurity shrank. And tax receipts, corporate tax receipts grew. How's that possible? Because it turns out getting the tax and regulatory code meant investments in things that made us more productive. When you make 
society more productive? What are the two ways you get paid more? Inflation, which just means you're getting compensated for really bad public policy. The dollar worth, is worth less, so we're going to pay you more so you just hold even. When your paycheck goes up for inflation, you didn't gain anything. The other thing economics tells you is you pay people more because being more productive. And that productivity is absolutely necessary if we're going to survive our demographic curve, if we're going to make, make our promises on Social Security and Medicare. You've got to understand it. All this has to work together. You've got to do everything from immigration policy to environmental policy to tax policy to regulatory policy. You've got to get all these things right. But instead, we're going to just do the trite around here and we're going to do great virtue signaling. And why this board is important is the quarters now where we're starting to see Democrat policy kick in, we're having an absolute crash of productivity. So you're saying, but we have all these people working. Okay. But the math is the math. They may be working, but something's going on out there. And maybe this is the phasing out of the expensing, which was part of the tax reform. We're trying to make it, some on our side are trying to make it permanent. Democrats oppose it. But this is really bad. You need this to look very, very different. Even if you just cared about inflation, productivity is one of your cures. If you get someone here who says Congress doesn't have influence, this is about monetary supply, and it's the Federal Reserve, yeah, it is. My argument is, is when we pump out spending that's going to require borrowing, and the Federal Reserve basically acts like our daddy who indemnifies us from really stupid policy and buys up our debt, we're functionally creating monetary policy by our profligate spending. And instead of putting those dollars into things that change productivity, change people's ability to survive and have wealth and economically grow and therefore bend the inflation curve, we did just the opposite. We handed out money at one point to encourage people to stay home. And somewhere here, I think I have the Larry Summers chart that, remember, a couple years ago, Larry Summers was like an absolute hero of the left. Great academics, well-spoken, well-respected, and then he made the sin of saying, please don't do this. Dumping another 1.9 trillion on the economy when you're not asking people to either step up their skills or actually participate in the economy. Please don't do this. And all of a sudden the left, as they do because he didn't engage in sort of the theater of virtue signaling, turned on him, oh, he's evil, he's bad. Well, it turns out he was right. The amount of misery these crappy economics have created to people in this country. The number of people are poor. One of the projects we're working on in our office is functioning in a decade. The Social Security Trust Fund runs out of money, 12 and a half years. And we haven't calculated in the inflationary cycle yet. That wasn't part of the trustees report. Okay. Let's say this place continues to do what it does, which is nothing, and we don't fix it. With the cost of everything being higher, even though you've had the Social Security colas, but now you've got to still pay your health care co-pays, which are inflation double at double the rate, you may be heading towards doubling the number of senior Americans who are in poverty. So the number of members here who are getting, getting behind the microphone saying, oh, this is just transitory. It's Putin's tax hike. It's, it's, it's the evil oil companies. No. No, it was crappy policy. Larry Summers and others told you it was. They told you this was coming. Try to continue to virtue signal or blame other people. Madam Speaker Pro Tem, may I ask for time? The gentleman has 20 minutes remaining. So, Madam Speaker, um, one five? 20. 20, Two zero. sorry. I need to listen better. I'll do my very best not to use up that time. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm not even sure I should do this one to all of you. We'll come back to that previous one and see if we can make it make more sense. So let's see. The left has been in control here for, what, what are we, about 18 months? So since President Biden was sworn in, anyone off the top of your head, before looking at the slide, how much has been added to the deficit? So under unified Democrat control, how much have we borrowed? Remember, you have a president who almost gleefully gets behind a microphone and says, I've lowered. Well, that's because some of the borrowing during the pandemic was insane. We've borrowed 4.8 trillion. And here's some of the things, you know, the rescue plan, the omnibus, you know, um, you start to add in just the growth of spending. And then what's fascinating is we're now finally starting to see some of these charts that have interest. One of the reasons I wanted to touch on that, you do realize our borrowing costs today have almost doubled. Actually, I think they've more than doubled since the day President Biden was sworn in. There is a model out there that says if you had a two-point higher interest rate on U.S. sovereign debt over function, I think the model was 25 years, two point higher. Do you understand? We're two points plus higher right now, but if that were to be sustained for about 25 years, at the end of that 25 years, every dime of tax receipts from this government pays nothing but interest. Now back to the slide where I was fixated on productivity and economic growth. Are you getting the pitch? If we would stop the clown show and start to fixate on things that help people. And that's, is helping people really Republican or Democrat? Because this place isn't doing it. We subsidize people. We sure hand out a hell of a lot of checks. But almost none of that makes society healthier and more productive. There is a path. And when you start to see things like this and realize when we factor in the new interest rates, the amount of just the financing just the financing on 4.8 trillion of additional borrowing we've done in what the last 18 months when the two year today was what three and a half still going up why isn't there a sense of worry around here I mean you, you, you all walk around with these cell phones you know there's calculators on them And this was just an attempt, and I know the slide is noisy. We were just trying to work in what are the components of, real, of GDP now. If right now, uh, let's see if I can make this make sense. If you're crazy enough to have been watching this, there's an app you can go to right now and download it. It's from the Atlanta Federal Reserve. It's called GDP Now. And what they try to do is take data sets as they come out, and it's a formula. It's just, it's pure math. This isn't like the New York Fed, which actually does attitudinal things in, and sort of um, purchasing attitudes and savings attitudes. GDP now is just cold, hard math. And this was an attempt to just try to show, show hey, here's some of the components in GDP now's real GDP calculator and what's going on. Because as you know, GDP in the first quarter came in negative. But there were, there were genuinely some timing and some energy effects in that one. But GDP now and the GDP in second quarter came in negative. And that one was, well, it looks like it's structural. As of about two hours ago, the GDP now web app you can put on your phone a couple weeks ago, they thought this quarter was going to be about a 2.5% growth rate, which would have been nice. It, it sort of meant, hey, the fall of economic expansion looks like it had bent and was coming back up. As of a couple hours ago, now it's fallen 
all the way down to 0.3 with negative bias, meaning these inputs that the Atlanta Fed is using continue to fall. I'm going to predict we're heading into a third, a third negative GDP quarter. Now, are we going to have the same argument that we had last quarter? Well, technically, two negative quarters is not a recession. Technically, we have this little committee over here, and they decide if it's a recession. So we spent a week trying to decide. Should we call it a recession? Could we say we're not in a recession? And my attitude was, who cares? How would we do something that would be much more compassionate? Let's go talk to the family down the street that's just trying to survive and ask them how they're doing. So I'm going to get up here and geek out on the components that actually go into a GDP calculator. My real request. is this place functionally start to understand the crappy policies we've made the last 18 months? We can reverse course. We can do things policy-wise that get economic growth, get productivity, produce hydrocarbons, produce the things that are components for prosperity or we can continue to functionally export misery, not only throughout our country, but throughout the world. Because that's what we've done. Because be prepared. In a couple weeks, you're going to find out we've had another quarter of negative growth. We're going to have the press and the Democrats say, oh, but that's not a real definition of a recession. That's a committee over here. Let's talk about Migrants being shipped to, you know, and instead we will do everything we can to understand the scale of the economic dislocation that policy around here has done in the last year and a half. And understand, uh, Republicans, we're going to take the majority of this House this November. My math, from what I can see policy-wise, even though we controlled everything, it's going to take years to fix. Because remember the opening here? I tried to explain something, and that was called the yield curve. When you have an inverted yield curve, what does it mean? It's not that complicated. My two-year T-bill. And so I give you money to hold a two-year Treasury bomb, full faith and credit of you, the taxpayers. Or a five-year, a seven-year. All those are paying higher interest rates than if you bought a 10-year. That lets you know the markets now believe inflation is here for years and years and years. And the data on these boards now says inflation is here for years and years and years and years. How much policy do you see coming from our brothers and sisters in the majority demonstrating they care enough to actually take on the misery? Are we just going to engage in the political theater, the virtue signaling to survive the next election cycle? Um, Madam Speaker Pro Tem, I apologize for the discombobulation of not having the board set up. But with that, I yield back.